Welcome, everyone. It is Friday, November 13th. I'm Lisa Norell. It's great to see you here today. I'm a frequent speaker, CMO advisor, LinkedIn learning, knowable, and Skillsoft faculty member. And these are our weekly mindful marketer live streams. And we live stream here the first three Fridays of the month from 1.30 to 2.10 p.m. And oh, are you in for a treat today? Oh boy, we have already got people waving and saying hello. We have Robbie from Northern California. So let me fill you in on today's exciting program. Now, this month is Purpose Month, as I may have mentioned to you. And last week, we had Lisa McLeod join us to talk about the system behind purpose. We started off with Lisa because she really understands purpose and she walked us through a process which I, I have created called the purpose trifecta. And she was part one of that trifecta. She showed us how to define noble purpose, which is driving revenue and doing work that makes you proud. So we walked through the first part of this three part series. Today, we're talking about how to design your big, sexy idea, your purpose that really gets people galvanized and energized around what your company stands for or what your ideas are all about. So if you're watching us today and you're either an expert, author, or a corporate executive, then you've come to the right place. Because so many of my clients right now are stuck in kind of COVID hell where they had a great idea, a great big sexy idea for their company, but that idea is not really resonating the way it used to. So their sales pipelines are stalled, their people feel demoralized, they're just not energized right now to move forward. And that is something we're going to help you address today. Next week, we'll talk about deployment. But for now, we want to make sure that you find that happy center between define, design, and deploy. Now, if you want further information about the purpose trifecta, do drop me a note and to lisa at lisanorell.com, and I will make sure that you get a copy of this slide. But without further ado, I am very excited to tell you about today's guest, Mark Levy. He's going to walk us through today how you design your big, sexy idea in a way that is easy to understand and most importantly, excites your intended audiences. Mark is the author of the best-selling book, Accidental Genius, which I keep in my library at all times. This thing is marked up more than the, uh, the skid marks in my garage from being an average Parker. And um, Mark has worked with the who's who of experts and organizations. He's worked with Marshall Goldsmith. He's worked with Simon Sinek. He's worked with numerous television, Broadway, and Las Vegas performers, as well as a speaker to the United Nations and the former head of strategy at Harvard Business School. How do you like that for a collection of clients? So what's what I love about Mark, too, is we've both had the pleasure of collaborating over the last decade, and he has helped me craft my big, sexy idea several years ago, which led to my second book, The Mindful Marketer. So without further ado, let's welcome Mark Levy. Mark, good afternoon. Hey, you know, you showed accidental genius. So today, am I... There I am. All right, good. So today, uh, this week, I actually got a new client. Hint, hint to everyone listening. I got a new client. And this is what he said to me uh, uh, in the email. He said, he said that his girlfriend and he, between them, have four copies of Accidental Genius. That oh coincidentally, my. because it had been in two different editions. So I guess they both have both editions of the book. But anyway, this is why I'm saying this story. He said, he said that when he met her, like, and they were talking about their favorite books, they both talked about accidental genius, and like he scored points with her. And I said, <laughs> I've never had anyone 
I've never scored points for anyone in any uh, uh, romantic relationship uh, with my book on writing, Accidental Genius. So I was thrilled to hear that. That's all I can say. Who knew that, Axel, this is the part about being a, an author that I absolutely love is you and I, we go into writing our books with all the best intentions, with the cogent marketing plan. And then somebody contacts us and says, hey, I love your book because dot, dot, dot. And you say, wow, I never thought it would have that kind of impact. Well, related to that, I remember with Joel Bauer, I co-wrote a book called How to Persuade People Who Don't Want to Be Persuaded. And um, in it, we show very theatrical ways of persuasion, among other things, these ideas we call transforma transformation mechanisms. And anyway, Joel once got an email from someone who, so this is a book for business people on how to persuade in very dramatic, big ways. And he got an email from someone who ran like some in-person live suicide like prevention group that everyone in the group was super depressed. They had tried to commit suicide or they were contemplating suicide, whatever. And so this guy wrote to Joel and said, reaching people who are that depressed and that self-focused, like super depressed is very, very difficult to even get their attention. So he said, I read your book and like I used some of those transformation mechanisms and everyone like got excited and paid attention and it allowed us to talk about very meaningful things. So thank you. And so again, it was, you're talking about this stuff out of left field is like, like we wrote a book we thought was like a sales book and right. here in the most wonderful way, people are using it to reach depressed people. It was like super cool to hear. Well, this is what I appreciate about you, Mark. You are kind of my Stephen Pressfield because, <laughs> you know, he wrote The War of Art and his book has had so many different applications and he is so gifted at writing film scripts and so many other things. And you are that kind of person, like your versatility is what I think makes you an accidental genius. I appreciate you really that. are because I, like, I, I want people to know this, like in COVID times, we are in, we have less time driving and so we have more time to be creative and to explore new ways to express ourselves. And um, so you, but you've done this well before COVID. You have, you have performed magic, you write, you are a pet lover, you love hiking. I mean, you, you have a lot, you have a panoply of, of hobbies that help you be such a great consultant and news for your clients. Well, I, I appreciate you uh, saying that. Thank you so much. I would actually say, um, um, uh, it, well, it's, it, it's interesting. The fact that I do, I, I consider myself an urban explorer. You know, I explore, I explore, you know, boarded up buildings and things like, you know, like, you know, I do this on the weekends. I do, I, I, I'm an amateur historian. So I go out and I do all kinds of crazy things to try to find out the history uh, of what, and there's Robbie saying hi. There's hey. Robbie. Yeah. Uh, um, um, I still remember the time, by the way, I, I was in Washington, D.C., in the and it was nighttime, and I was on my iPhone looking for the longitude and latitude of the central point of Washington, right? Because Washington was built as a spoke. There's a center to it, and on they, they designed the city this way. And so all the streets would radiate out from the spoke. And I didn't know where the center was, but I had the longitude and latitude, and I was trying to find it, and it was super dark out. And I'm walking around Washington like this, looking at my phone, the longitude and latitude, and, for, and I get stopped by a Secret Service person dressed all in black in body armor with a machine gun. And he says, may I help you, sir? And I said, I'm looking for, I forget what the central point's called. And I said, the central point, but he said, oh, it's over there. And so I start walking there and at like a hundred yards later, another secret service guy in body armor with a machine gun stops. He said, may I help you, sir? And I say the same thing, it's there. And it ends up at the central point. There's this little kind of statue or this thing there, but it's like 150 yards from the front door of the White House. And I didn't realize that. So I was like walking into restricted territory uh, uh, um, but the point that I want to make here is 
is it's the fact, and I say this, this is for everyone out there listening, um, that um, you can't come up with great ideas all the time if you approach a subject in a direct, head-on, straight way. Now, I have nothing more important than this to say. So if, if you want, you know, this is, this is it. So like, if you could come up with all the great ideas that you need head on, you would have them and you'd have no need of like reading books and so like, because you'd have all these great ideas. So it is essential that you approach your subject at times indirectly, that you need to make these circular routes. You need to get lost. You need to get off the path and whatnot. Uh, 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 you need to put your mind in different places and then bring it back to your subject and say, so from what I've learned in these new places, what can this be about? I can't tell you how many times people have called me for an idea to base their company on or their brand, their personal brand or their new book. And I came up with the idea of, oh yeah. And I give them like something that I thought about that comes from the world of archeology span or from watching a Bowery Boys film or something like that. Like it's just some idea that has nothing to do with their field or military history. And I bring it there and I pull it in and I say, oh, this worked in the battle of whatever, it can work for you here. And it does, you know? So it's, I essential. Love that. it's essential for everyone listening. Like, like you can't just stay at your desk and focus on what it is that you already always focus on. Like it is essential for the good of your business that you develop new hobbies and you go on trips that you're not quite sure what the point of it is. It's like absolutely essential. And then I'll shut up and you can ask me your formal questions. But Roger Shank, who's a, an artificial intelligence scientist whose books I adore, um, he was at Yale, Northwestern and so forth. So Shank said essentially um, that intelligence is you fill your mind with cases. Like in other words, with things, with stuff that people have done in the world. Here's how they built the pyramids. Here's how Apple does this. Like big and small, you, you fill all your head with all this stuff. And then you look at something and you say, what does this remind me of? And that's what intelligence is. Like, and that's what creativity is. Like you fill your head with cases. What does this remind me of? You look for anomalies in the situation. Like, why is this an anomalous thing? Why am I, didn't I expect this? What's that telling me or so? And you just follow that stuff. And you, you come up with big ideas all day long. I know. And this really hit home for me. I remember I was on one of my many trips. I was coaching or consulting in Atlanta, Georgia. And you and I had one of our uh, creativity calls. When right. I was, remember I said, okay, I just signed the deal with my publisher. I have no freaking clue what I'm going to write about. You know, I only that's have like every, That's like every third call we do. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember I was pacing the floor and you said, all right, now Lisa, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. And you started and I was thinking, all right, I have no idea. Mark, why are you asking me a question right. about yoga? I mean, what you're, are you, I almost asked you in my New York tone, are you wasting my freaking time? Right. You know, like I was this close to saying it, but I said, all right, I, I have paid you good money here. So I'm going to just indulge Mark Levy for a bit to see if this goes anywhere. And then a little while long, a little while later, I remember that the skies opened and the angels started singing. And I went, we both went like the mindful marketer, the mind, right. you mean well, mindful and marketing well, and my, well, and that's how it happened. Essentially. I ask clients questions, very straightforward, obvious questions. And I listen very closely. You know this, cause I'm going to sound dismissive the way I say this. I don't mean to, you know, I listen very, very earnestly and closely. And, when I start getting bored, like if they start saying stuff, like after a while, if it starts getting boring, now I know it's time that we need to jump the track. And so I, on purpose, right, I call myself the human, human inner ear infection. My job is to disorient them 
so that they're kind of like dizzy and they start telling me and they start reaching for ideas and stories and insights that they wouldn't normally reach for. So I start to ask them questions just to get them off their normal way of thinking. I remember one of my clients, um, he, he had gotten a book deal. Now, I don't just deal with people with books. I deal with all kinds of differentiation or so. But this was a person who had a book deal, but he, he had the contract. And he sat down to write it and he was absolutely terrified. He didn't know what it was that like, like because your book proposal is your promise of what you're going to do, but it doesn't mean you can do that. Like you're the, the promise of what you do, whoop, and the promise of what you do and you actually executing on it are two different things at times. So he was absolutely terrified. So he, I said, what is your book supposed to be about? And he said, oh, blank. And I said, hey, okay. Hey, Mark. Uh, yeah. I, I'm pausing you for one minute. Tell us that because we just had a network temporary outage and we bounced back. Can oh, yeah. you tell us again, for those who may have missed it, because I did, the name of the author you're describing. Oh, well, I hadn't said his name, but I'll oh. say it. So Steve Cohen, the millionaire's magician, he's a brilliant performer. So Steve had a book deal with a major publishing house. and But when he first sat down, he didn't quite know how to approach his subject, even though he had a contract for it. But this happens to everyone. It's not like something to Steve, it's to like 80% of authors, they have that problem. So I knew, I said, I have to get Steve, He's he. I have to get him off this one, this straightforward way he's thinking. So I said to Steve about the subject, um, I said, because his subject was about persuasion and uh, it just so happened. It was about persuasion. And I said to him, Steve, divide persuasion up into four categories. I know that it doesn't really have four categories. We're playing a game. But if it had four categories, what would the four categories be? And so he instantly said, oh, blah, blah, blah. He said four things. I said, great. So let's pick one of those four categories. Pick one. It's like, pick a card. You're a magician. Pick a card. So <laughs> pick one. And I said, great. Divide that up into four. And so we did. And I said, great. Pick one of those. And now tell me about it. And I started taking notes of what he said. And I said, okay, pick another one of those. And we started taking notes anyway. And I sent him the notes and the stuff that we came up in with just from disorienting him were almost verbatim, like, like a sixth of the book. Like that was what the book was predominantly. Wow. It's because, you know, we have a lot of, uh, um, um, we have a lot of great ideas. We have a lot of great ways of approaching th uh, uh, things. It's just that we're often locked into certain channels of thinking about things. So it is essential that you get backed into a corner so you have to think differently because we won't usually think differently on our own because thinking differently is difficult. So we say we want to think differently, but we don't know how to do it. Like there's all kinds of things. So you kind of need someone, hint, you need someone who will push you like in a way where you can't really escape. Uh, like I call it forced creativity where if you follow the rule of the game that you're playing, right, exactly, exactly, yeah. David Bernie, the value and importance of nonlinear thinking, that's exactly right. But the thing, David Bernie, that I want to say is people will often, like, uh, uh, they will try to escape nonlinear thinking because they don't understand what the value of it is. So you kind of need to force them into a corner by playing a game with them or somehow holding, folding their feet to the fire where they have to just follow one new rule in a specific game. Right. And that gets them generating new ideas. So is that um, uh, one more thing along these ways and then I'll, yeah. then I'll shut up. I have a couple uh, we'll other do, we'll do questions. Your, we'll do your questions in the second hour. First hour. <laughs> we more. only have four more hours together, right, Mark. Right, exactly. Like one of my clients who just had a Wall Street Journal best-selling book this year, he had called me like two years ago. He said, I want to come up with a new idea for a book, but I don't want it to be anything unlike like anything I had done so far. And he's one of the top marketing gurus in the world. And I said, okay, great. I know that he likes to stay. He likes to be super relevant, super relevant. So I said, have you ever been to a Comic-Con? 
write the comic convention. He said, no, I've always wanted to go. I said, I thought you would. And it ended up that in two weeks, coincidentally, near his house in Boston, there was going to be a Comic-Con. So I said, great. I want you to go to Comic-Con. I want you to interview 10 people. They can be people like cosplay people, people manning a booth, Harrison Ford, like whoever you come across, I want you to interview 10 people. And I want you to come back and tell me five things about marketing that you didn't know before you got there. This is a guy who has audiences of 5,000 people. Wow. Like, he talks to about marketing. I want you to tell me five things about marketing you didn't know when you went to come. And he came back and we talked about what he had discovered. And that became his book, his Wall That's Street beautiful. Journal. So again, it's forcing people to do like one rule. It's like, tell me five things you didn't know about marketing. Divide this up into four. Tell me each one of those four pieces. You know, like I it's stuff that. like that. Yeah. I love that. Right, now we'll get to your questions. Or David Bernie can ask me questions. Well, he, David's he, from Dave, I want you to know who's here. We have we have Robbie from San Francisco. Okay, we have Michael from Atlanta. We have hey, David Michael. from New York. We have a bunch of people checking in from San Antonio, Texas. So we we've got oh, I love San Antonio. Oh, we yes. have some terrific visitors with us today. I want to remind people that you can put your questions in. We will do our best to get to as many as possible. And then also, if you go to my website and sign up, we'll make sure you get access to all the replays for our weekly Mindful Marketer live streams. And share this with your friends while you're watching so they can hop on over the next 15 or 20 minutes and also get some great value and ideas from Mark. So Mark, by the way, did you know that your glasses look just like the ones that Steve Jobs used to wear. Really? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, those are Steve right. Jobs oh. glasses. Um, I want to ask I you- I consider them John Lennon glasses, but Steve Jobs is pretty good too. Okay. <laughs> we also have a, a person here, a LinkedIn user. Tell us where you're from, LinkedIn user. They said, Mark, I like how you free minds to insightful thinking. Thank it you is so really, much. Thank you. That is so powerful. How it do you keep, and so tell us LinkedIn user where you're from. And Mark, I want to ask you a personal question with the- Maybe cap, LinkedIn user is the same. Did you ever think of that? Say it again, because the network- Did I freeze? Did, a, did you hear that? Yeah, you froze. Go ahead. I, oh, I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, maybe LinkedIn user is their given name. <laughs> so it's Mrs. User or Mr. User. Right, okay. Exactly. Mr. and Miss User, right? Mr. and Mrs. User. And um, we we are all living through lockdown times. COVID is nothing to laugh about. How do you you are one of my avatars? You know, I have a top 10 list of most influential people in my life, and I really meet living. They're all living people. Um, how do you personally keep your creative juices flowing during COVID when we can't just hop on a plane and, and just travel, travel freely the way we used to? Oh, well, first, I'm very honored uh, uh, that you would say that. So thank you so much. Uh, so I do it. I do it in a bunch of different ways. So one thing I do is when I'm when I'm working with someone, and sometimes I tell my client uh, uh, this ahead of time, not always. And then this is a very unexpected and probably uh, something they don't like. But uh, when I'm listening to them, I tell them, I say, I swing at every pitch. So in other words, what I mean is when they're talking to me, everything they say, I'm thinking, oh, what happens if this was their big idea? Oh, what if this was their big idea? Oh, what's the lesson here that they're not seeing? Oh, and I'll often say that stuff. And the reason why I tell them that is because I don't want them to think just because I say something, it doesn't mean that's the live all and end all of, you know, I tell them I swing at every pitch and that's how you're creative, that you can't be too discriminating. Hey, Drew, uh, uh, um, you can't be too discriminating in order to create. Like you can't wait for the right idea. You have to 
like do all the ideas. So uh, like, like that's why I go to new places and I try to understand why things were created the way, way they do. Or, you know, like, let's say, you know, like why a path, I'm just thinking aloud here, why a, a, a path in the grass, like people's feet wore a path in the grass, like why didn't they use the path? Like, why is it this path? Like, why is it here? And why didn't they use that path? And where are they coming from that they would? It's stuff like that. It's just always walking around. And like, why is that tree bark that way? But this tree bark another way, you know? So and it, so, but it's not just waiting to Google things, although I Google plenty of things or so, but it's also taking guesses before I even get to Google. Yes. And so I do that all day long. Like that's a daily thing many, 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 many times a day. Why is this like this? I wonder why it's like this. How could this be different? All day long. It's a habit. What were you going to say? Your core value, other than humor, is curiosity. Right. You're, you have insatiable curiosity. Right. And I, I want to challenge everyone watching is, what do you do every day to cultivate insatiable curiosity, even when COVID might be restricting some of your prior habits. Right. 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 I'd love to ask you uh, also about big, sexy ideas that never worked out. Have you seen any brands lately that have fallen flat on their face with their alleged big, sexy idea, or should I say the big, sexy idea that bombed? Right. Well, if it fell on its face, it wasn't a big six. So to me, your big sexy idea, right? That's my thing. I help people come up with their big sexy idea. It's their differentiating idea. It's the differentiating idea that they're going to be putting at the fore of everything they do. And, you know, that's the thing they're going to be trumpeting. Anyone in the marketplace who falls in love with that idea has to seek you out for it because you embody that idea. You represent that idea in people's minds. If they went somewhere else for that idea, they would be going for the diet version of that idea. Like, you know what I mean? It wouldn't be the real version. They'd have to come to you for the real version. So that to me is, is what a big sexy idea is. And I don't know, I, uh, I uh, you know, this idea of brands that have fallen flat on their faces, I don't usually, um, so it's a great question, but I don't usually look at the world in that way. I try to look at the world, um, except when it comes to politics, then I look at the world in very, in very I won't talk about any of that, but I look at the world in very critical ways. But when it comes to brands and things like that, I really just look at things as like, what can I learn here? I don't, I, I'll tell you one thing actually. All right, now you're getting me angry, right? And I have because, one too, so give, right, I want, right, I'll need 30 seconds. This is not right. This is not, you'll go in the third hour. All right, so, <laughs> so, so, I don't usually look critically at brands that much or so. I look at what it is that I can learn, except this is not about a specific brand, but this is something that really annoys me when it is I hear and I when I see this and I see it a lot. When I look at a like on a website or at a product or so, and then they say our story. Right. Like 50 percent of all businesses have that, like on the side of milk cartons, our story or power bars or especially especially purpose driven companies. Right. That's right. He, our story. And when I read that and they say nothing of any real specificity or differentiation, I go ballistic. Because remember, I'm a differentiation guy. I'm a story guy. So when you say our story to me, I think, oh my God, this is why you do this work. Like this is why you're doing this and you're not doing something else. This is going to be great. And when I read it, 95% of the time, it's BS. It's horrible. I, like, I remember, not that this is some new up-to-date thing, I remember standing at line uh, a few years ago at a Quiznos, and they had on the barrier, the sneeze guard, I guess, between you and the people, it's in our story. And it said something like, 
our story is to serve like fresh meat and vegetables. And it's like, I'm asleep already. Right. It's like, what are you like? <laughs> all you did. Like, like, I don't even know what they did, but it was horrific. Like to me, it's because you, you uh, got my attention. Here's the key. You got my attention. I want to know what David Bernie has to say about this. <laughs> um, that, that you got my attention under false pretenses. You said yes. our story. So listen. And then you told me something that was sleep inducing. And oh, that thank you. angers me. Mark, what you say? Yeah. Mark, your New Jersey is showing. I love it. Right, exactly. And I wanted to share the Queeby story. All right. Jeff, here's a two billionaires come together, unlimited funding, unlike most of us on this live stream. They have unlimited funding. Um, they have uh, celebrity gravitas. They, their, their Rolodex in Hollywood is so thick, they can barely fit the, the book on their desk. And they start this web, this new streaming service called Queeby. And their story, don't ask me. I have no idea what their story was other than we're a streaming platform that's going to try to compete with Netflix and Hulu and Disney+. Plus. That was their story. Well, Meg Whitman was interviewed on CNBC about two months before they shut their doors. And I kid you not, because you can't make this up, she was never, she wasn't wearing any makeup. And her, her webcam was clearly a Walmart $10 webcam and her voice was shaking and the video quality was so horrible. I had to turn my face. I, I could not watch this poor woman representing a streaming service with a billionaire woman who couldn't afford to spend a thousand dollars on a new studio. So I thought if, you know, it, it all starts with the founders. If you can't even embody the story or the, if you don't even have the big sexy idea in your bones, how can you expect to publish it on your website and be believable? So right. rest in peace, Queeby. And right. another question from da David is definitely uh, asking some great questions here. Mark, what techniques have you used to get an organization to have the courage to make bold changes? Oh, that's a, right. That's a great question. So what I try to do is to work with courageous organizations. Sounds like I'm making a joke. I'm not making a joke. Like, you know, I like to work predominantly with daring brands or with daring thought leaders, with people who are not afraid to go. See, sometimes people, and I'll answer your question, David. Um, um, but um, sometimes people come to me and they want differentiation. They want bold ideas and things like that. But what they really want is they want differentiation with total safety. And I say, look, the idea of differentiation is you're going to stand out. Like we can actually make you stand out. Standing out is not that difficult. But if you stand out, know that you're going to stand out. Are you prepared for that? Uh, I remember a, a friend of mine, uh, a colleague of mine, he's a therapist, a uh, wonderful guy, David Reynolds, Dr. David Reynolds. David said something once like, like our greatest fear is, is not standing out and our greatest fear is to stand out. Like simultaneously, we want to stand out and we don't want to stand out. So people sometimes kind of come to me and they want to stand out in a big forceful way and then when we come up with an idea to make them stand out, it's like, oh, my God, well, people are going to like see that and whatnot. It's like, yeah, that's exactly what it is that that uh, is supposed that that's why you hired me. Um, so the idea of techniques that um, that could make uh, that get people uh, uh, to take on bold ideas, probably the best technique. And again, thank you for that question, David. Um is the idea of, I love to use stories, right? You, everyone hears about stories all the time, but I, I use stuff in super tactical ways. Like I help them use stories to see when they've been courageous before 
and how they might try on new forms of courage in the future. So in other words, I'll like get them to think about their resumes and think you've accomplished a lot of stuff. And, but before you accomplished it, you didn't know if you could accomplish it. What in your past have you done that really required courage, whether you remember it as courage or not? Like, because you've acclimated to it. So you don't really think of it that way, right? You're already there. Right. But one time it took courage, either a small amount of courage or a big amount of courage. And so we tell each other stories about proud moments in our life and courageous moments in our life about things that we've done or so. And then other stories about people who've taken similar paths and had to show courage and what we, we might do. Does that make sense uh, to everyone listening, to David and everyone listening? Like this idea of of looking to where you've been courageous and you might not have appreciated it or you might have forgotten it, but also stories around that because stories are, you can remember and you can pass them around. Like they're very portable. So you can always carry a story with you to remind yourself to be, to be uh, uh, courageous. And you can repeat to yourself the stories over and over again. By the way, like, as you know, you know this, Lisa, you know, I'm a keynote speaker, right? I'm a keynote speaker. And so sometimes I have to speak in front of uh, uh, like enormous crowds. And so to go, and I love doing it, but the- you And know, you're shy, but we help right, overcome exactly. your shyness. Exactly. But I always taught this idea of taking something that's portable with you before I speak to the crowd. I always say to myself, go in full strength, full power. Like these are exactly the words I say to myself. It's like, you're going to go in there full strength, full power. You're going to own the room. They're going to love you. And you don't even have to be perfect to do it. Like you can be flawed. You can make mistakes, but you go in full power and you're going to kill. And that's how I go in. But like, that's like that's my portable story. That's how I remind myself of of like how to get. So I hope that kind of answers uh, David's question. And if I can say a relate a, a semi related thing, right? To yeah, we're all um, and we're almost time wrapped. We're almost at the wrap up time. Oh my god! I, didn't I even know. know how long we had. I know. I did tell you we had four hours, but I was just right. Kidding. Exactly. All right. So let me tell you this super cool story then. So years ago, I was taking stand-up comedy. I took a stand-up comedy course. And by the way, the finale was I did five minutes at Caroline's on Broadway on a Saturday night. Like, and I had never done stand-up before, right? So I like to do courageous things, brave things. And I remember before I had gone out there, I mean, a day or two before, I met with my teacher, the guy who was teaching the course. And I said, oh yeah, I'm super nervous about it or whatnot. And he said, why are you nervous? He said, uh, I said, well, maybe I'd make a mistake or something like that. And here, and this is stuck with me, right? And this is for everyone, no matter what it is that you're doing. Um, he said to me, he said, doing a great job out there and doing a perfect job out there are two different things that have nothing to do with one another. He said, he said, he said, it's like, if I decided we were in New York City, he said, if I just, it's like if I decided I wanted to drive to Cape Cod this weekend, but I wanted to do it without making any left turns. It's like, what's that? Like, what's making no left turns have to do with getting to Cape Cod? They have nothing to do with one another. So he said, in the same way, you can go out there, you can make people laugh, you can have a great time, and you can forget some of your jokes, you can say them imperfectly, you can pull out your set on a paper in your pocket and read it, like, and you can still kill and being perfect and doing a great job, they're not the same thing. So I say that to anyone out there who's facing something that's important to them that like you can make mistakes and still achieve way beyond what it is that. You yes. Want to and the, this time during COVID, I, all of us, as Dan Pink reminds us in his book to sell as human as executives and experts, we spend 70% of our time persuading others or selling something. And that is a noble cause in itself. And because 
we are doing that, we have to feel strongly and excited about what it is we are presenting. Otherwise, people can call BS on us very, very quickly. And I would like to channel my inner Marianne Williamson because um, she reminds us that in, in her book, I believe, A Return to Love, she says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And it is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. So, you know, a lot of times when I'm advising clients and I coach some of the world's top CMOs and in our peer groups and independently, you know, it's we ask they ask themselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, it's who are you not to be? So I, I just believe that imposter syndrome or fear of being found out it, it sticks with, a, with us even when we do reach a certain pinnacle of success. And we have to have people around us like you to remind us, you know, don't let that stop you and don't look to be perfect. So I, I think this is a very important time. And I also want to mention one other thing, which is big, sexy ideas are being born right now more than they ever were. Because and in COVID times, we have no choice but to revisit the old traditions and throw them out and start new. And you're going to know if any of you here are executives and you market for a living, you sell for a living, you go to board meetings. This is the time to make changes because people are receptive to it. And if they're not, you're going to know right away. If you're a startup and you've been trying to get your first customer for 18 months, 24 months, guess what? You probably won't get any because by now they're either going to jump on it or not. It's it's not, you know, it, you're going to know very quickly. So I, I just want to remind people of that. And David from New York said, thank you. Very memorable and helpful conversation. Dear and Abby, was really your great great aunt? Oh my God, David, that is so interesting. The people that show up for our live streams, Mark, right? Just That's impressive. It's very exciting and very impressive. Um, you just this is the part where I'm really glad I took a three month improv comedy class because right. um, anything can happen. Anything can happen, Mark. And you can deal with it. And we can deal with it. Right. So what's the first step you would recommend people take to get their big, sexy idea off the ground? Uh, in order to find their big, sexy idea or to get yes. it off the... Well, we're going to talk next week about launching it within an organization. But how about germinating their big, sexy yeah. idea? Right. So um, I would say... so. So two questions you should ask yourself about what it is that you're, what you're trying to do. It's what's, uh, so they're, they're corollaries. They're on opposite sides of the spectrum. One is what's obvious about what it is that I'm trying to do or what this idea or this product or this service or whatever it is, what does it do for people? And write to yourself or talk to yourself in tremendous detail about what's obvious. The reason why I say obvious is because sometimes we try to be too clever and that trying to be clever freezes us up. You know, it freezes all, it's like, oh my God, I gotta be super smart. And so that can be scary. So to me, I start with what's obvious about, I mean, and it couldn't be too obvious. So I write everything down. And as you start to write down or think about what's obvious, insights occur to you because you feel less pressure. So that's the first thing. What's obvious about the work you're doing that, that you know, would pe how people would benefit. But again, plain Jane stuff, allow your mind to go to the, to the most uh, mundane and obvious levels. Uh, and then the other question is to ask yourself, what is it about what I'm doing that's surprising? Like, what is it that is surprising? What would people not expect from this? What is it that I didn't expect to see and I saw it? 
So again, because what surprise leads to, remember I talked about Roger Schenk and anomalies. Surprise leads to anomalies. And anomalies are like where the action is. It's like, oh, I didn't expect this. And so there's something important in what it is you didn't expect or what the audience Excellent. didn't expect. Excellent. Well, everyone, we have been here today spending a fabulous Friday with the one and only Mark Levy, the guru of innovation. And if you have not gotten the second edition of Accidental Genius. You need four editions. So you, you, need, can meet you need four someone. editions. Do not contact me. You are not getting my copy out of my cold, dead hands. And um, the, this book is phenomenal. And Mark is a tremendous idea Sherpa. And I, Mark, I can't wait to have you come back next year and enjoy your new digs. I hope everything goes well with your move. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank everyone for listening. This is great. And we have wrapped up here today, our mindful marketer live stream. And before you leave, I hope you will stay in touch with Mark, stay in touch with me. And come back November 20th, next Friday, 1.30 Eastern Time. We're going to look at the third leg of the purpose trifecta, which is deployment. And I will be proud to be spending some time with the CEO of Noetic Consulting, Nancy Reuter. And she'll be talking about putting your purpose to work. So with that, I want to welcome, what, wish you all a healthy and sane weekend. Get out there, do something different you've never done before. And as Mark says, be courageous and we'll see you next Friday.